my favorite one, actually, the most memorable was with my COO, George. So I am like, I'm definitely not a traditional seller. Like if you watch my technique, like I, I do my own thing a little bit and uh, I can be a little freewheeling. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it really doesn't. Thanks for tuning into The Windwire. Today, we're talking with someone I've been really excited to have on the show, Stevie Case, the Chief Revenue Officer at Vanta. Stevie's not just any revenue leader. Before climbing the ladder at places like Twilio and Visa, she had a pretty unique start, dropping out of college and becoming the top player globally in the game Quake, even beating one of the game's creators. Stevie's story was recently featured in Vanity Fair, and what I particularly admire about Stevie is her perspective as a female leader and a single mom with such a rich life already. We dove into her journey, which is full of unique insights and stories. And of course, we chat about that big win at Twilio that really changed her career. Without further ado, Stevie Case. Stevie, welcome to The Windwire. Thank you. I am excited and honored that anybody would think of me for this. I do love the art of the deal. So they probably just know I have a lot of that. I take a lot of joy in the process. So I'm, I'm well, excited to talk on it. For sure. And I don't think, you know, we don't necessarily want to be like, uh, you know, the anatomy of the deal show that gets like super deep into every tactic or whatever it might be. But I do think, you know, there is a very big difference between sort of the veneer of thought leadership and getting into, you know, how did someone actually do anything or what actually was relevant to them throughout their career? And, you know, as, as you and I talked before, you immediately jumped to this uh, deal that you saw as seminal uh, that you worked on at Twilio. But, you know, before we get into that, I'd love for you to provide some background about your career up to this point, right? And for those who don't know, and there's plenty of uh, information online to pour through about Stevie. She's had a very interesting life, I think, by a lot of people's standards, um, from gaming to sales. And, you know, you meet a lot of people in the industry who are pretty resistant to pulling back that veneer. Maybe they're mm -hmm. PR ready. Maybe they're just not that much interesting about them. Um, with you, it's the opposite, certainly. And so before we talk about that, like I said, can you just provide an overview of how you got up to this point, you know, what your initial journey was, you know, in life, I guess, um, and then finish off with who you were at that time? Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel really lucky and it has been a, a unique journey. And it's funny that you call that out. There is so much out there about me and I feel like I'm a very private person. Clearly, the Internet does not see it that way. You know, I, I started out my professional life thinking I was going to become a lawyer. I was like pre-law at the University of Kansas. I grew up in Kansas City area. And I just thought, like, I love law. I want to go into politics. I love speech writing. Like, this, that was my real passion. But uh, something happened to me in college that changed that trajectory. And that is that this game, Doom, that had been out, I was introduced to it. And then Quake, its, uh, its successor, came out. and turned out that I loved playing games and I was actually really good at it. So I kind of looked into this gaming career. I ended up playing uh, one of the designers of, of those games at his own game and beating him. And that sort of snowballed into this, this career. It led me to drop out of college at the time. I moved down to Dallas. I started making video games. And it led me to truly what I see now was the product side of software. And granted, it was very specialized software. It was interactive entertainment. It was like deep and first person shooters, but it really was product. And that led me on this journey. I ended up in LA. I was working at Warner Brothers um, making mobile games. And this is in the days of feature phones, like pre iPhone. So we were making uh, like games that had to be ported to thousands of devices. And I had the software vendor. And he approached me one day and said, I need to hire a junior salesperson. And I think I could teach you to do that. For me, that sounded deeply uncomfortable and like not in my wheelhouse. And I've always been of the mindset of like the more uncomfortable something is, the more you probably should do it because it's going to really challenge you to just change and get better. And, and so I took the leap and he took me on the road and he ended up being just the best teacher ever. He was brutal. Like he put me through it and he taught me how to sell. He showed me how and he taught me how. And, you know, 16, 17 years later, I've been in revenue that whole time. I've done pre-revenue startups. I've done the first million in revenue for, for startups. I've done, I did a series B company that ended up selling to, to Visa. So I spent some time at Visa doing like payments. 
I've been in communications. I was six years at Twilio before this, and uh, now I'm 18 months in at Vanta as the CRO, and it's my first CRO gig. So I'm having a lot of fun, and it's really challenging in every way I could ever imagine, and having a blast. It's really just a game of a different variety, if I'm being completely honest. Yeah, of course. And I, I, I actually am always talking about this a little bit, but um, but you have someone who's a competitive person in general. You have to kind of create these little competitions for yourself on a regular basis of saying like, what is the game of the moment? And like, <laughs> what does that look like? And it's probably a lot easier in sales where at least you have a, a real life number that you can say, look, here's what the high score is and here's what I need to beat. Um, but no, I, I think the journey is really interesting so far. And obviously we're talking today about um, kind of critical moment along that path. Uh, you'd obviously been in that next act of your career for a little while. Uh, who were you at the time, you know, when this deal at Twilio kicked off? You know, what was your, were you confident, you know, at that point? And, and what were kind of your motivations at the time? Confident. That's yeah. it. Am I confident at any point in this journey? Probably not. <laughs> um, you know, I think that's, that is part of, and I've embraced, it's part of what makes me, me is, Maybe I come off as confident. I don't feel that in the inside. Like I am, I am my own biggest critic. And I think it comes from just a desire to constantly be optimizing and doing better. And I am extremely competitive. We did Strength Finders this year, validated my number one characteristic <laughs> competitive. In this time at Twilio, it was. It was a really formative moment for me. So I had joined Twilio one week prior to the IPO. And really unique business because at that point, the business was $200 million in revenue and there was virtually no sales team and there was no real sales process or discipline. So, you know, I remember in those first couple of months, like there wasn't a quarterly close process. There weren't committed contracts. Like it was the total Wild West. The business had built this $200 million run rate with purely self-service product-led growth. This was a PLG business. Part of what I loved, and in my career, I've gone back and forth between being an IC and being a, a leader or manager. And when I went back to Twilio, I was coming off of a run at a startup where I had played honestly kind of like a co-founder like role. I felt like I was shouldering a lot of responsibility for the organization. I owned everything customer facing, brought the business to, I was the first non-technical hire, so pre-revenue, brought it to its first million in ARR. And I was really just looking to do something much more focused. So when I approached Twilio, I came in through a friend who was in engineering and they, they offered me a couple of roles. And one was more of a leadership role, like running an ISVs and partners team. And it was like more senior on the org chart and would have a team. And they, then they said the other option, we just hired all our direct sales leaders and promoted them. So we do have an enterprise AE role. If you would want to do that, I know it's like a step backwards. And Ended up picking the enterprise AE role. I was an AE at Twilio for the first two and a half of my six years there. And so as I'm doing the deal we're going to talk about today, I'm like about a year and a half into that run of being an AE and helping build the enterprise business on top of this PLG self-serve machine. Yeah. And so you're basically out there at this point saying, you know, you're happy enough to be where you are. You want to just go make a massive mark on the company, of course, and establish that yourself. And candidly, you probably had the ability to do that as even as an IC, given what the company needed. And so, you know, was this kind of a situation where you were the first to do something here? You know, what did, what did this look like? And I guess start taking us through it really blow by blow of, of what went down here. Absolutely. I was I was really excited to just go crush a quota. You know, the sales leader at the time said, we want to build a sales culture here. We want to have our first salesperson W2 a million dollars. And I was all in. But yes, I want to do that. And I actually really relished that like switch back from management, sales management into the IC role because you see it differently. And you start to realize there's so many different ways to sell, so much more creative than it might look. And you start to tap into all those other, uh, just all those other tools that you see other sellers succeed with that you don't think would work, but do. You know, so as I was about a year and a half in here, we were really just starting to like get the motion going of what does it mean to sell to an enterprise in earnest? You know, Twilio had some great 
quote unquote enterprise logos, but they were more like tech forward, like Amazon, Netflix, and like these tech forward companies, not like hardcore traditional enterprises. So in my first year, I was really focused on logos because we had this motion to like sign up and get, you know, commitments from enterprise Fortune 500 logos. In the first 12 to 18 months, I think I did something on the order of like 20 Fortune 500 logos. And part of what made this so great is I owned half of the United States as an NAE. So I had like this massive territory, every company over a thousand employees in, in the U.S., in the Western U.S. So I started trying to figure out how to leverage these opportunities out of the PLG funnel. So like self-service developers signing up, experimenting, spending five, ten dollars at a time. How do you turn that into something? And a lot of those initial enterprise deals came from that. It's like you talk to the developer, you understand what they're trying to do. You start to think about how to get in touch with power and figure out who the buyer is and like then turn that into a committed contract of any size. So part of what I love about this USAA deal is that it started just like that with a developer signing up on the website, going self-service, pay as you go, and just like experimenting and building this project in a labs group at this huge financial institution. And that's really where the conversation with them started. Yeah. Well, and I, I think it's a moment that a lot of other people can kind of em empathize with of how do we even start to get this motion rolling and get known for something? Is it even possible? Um, and, you know, I think for people who know USAA, uh, you know, I think a lot of people have seen the commercials, but don't have a direct experience with them. It is really one of the vanguard businesses in the United States and probably was something that was intimidating at the time. Uh, you know, how did you actually start that? How did you start to get in with them? And how did you like think about that approach of building that mm -hmm. bottoms up motion? So a lot of the magic that I think we found and a lot of what worked in this deal was embracing embracing plg and it's it it's such a kind of counterintuitive thing as an enterprise seller because i think there's this inclination that oh i need control over my deal and I think a lot of more classic enterprise sellers view plg as a threat because they're like oh my gosh the wild west like anybody can sign up i don't have any leverage i have no control to get my deal done if you can just go on a website so i really flipped that on its head and with this case we had a, a developer that had signed up and like clearly started building something, was doing some simple SMS alerts. And like mission one was just get them on the phone and understand what the heck are you doing? And so we started this conversation. Turns out they were building this like simple notifications use case uh, where they had like a, this character they had created. And they wanted to run this like loyalty program where you'd sign up for these SMS alerts and you get these cute little notifications in the voice of the character that would encourage you to save and encourage you to use more of your tools that you've got available in the bank at USAA. Banking is just one of their businesses, but like that's where it started. And they said, you know, like we don't know what we're going to spend five hundred dollars. Like it started very small. And that's how a lot of these deals there did. And I said, great. So rather than saying, OK, the person I'm talking to is not the executive buyer. They don't have budget. It's a labs group. It's whatever. I really went deep with them. And I just thought of myself as their customer success person, that if I can make them successful in this use case, that's going to open all of the other doors. So I educated them. I sent them all kinds of like I'd point them at the correct parts of the documentation. I considered myself their personal support person. Like whatever they needed, I would do it. I would figure it out and I would make them like feel as loved as possible as a customer. And you know, the program launched and it turns out it was like award winning. They, you know, it was kind of this like novelty, but won a bunch of like customer service awards. They're really invested in their quality of customer service. So they doubled down on it and launched it bigger. And by the end of the year, they had actually spent a hundred thousand dollars. And now it wasn't in a committed contract yet, but they had spent a lot more because it had gone. So that was sort of like phase one of the relationship. But I knew there was a lot more to do with these guys. But now I'd built a great relationship. So I had a base base to grow from, really. Yeah, of course. And I, of course, there's some of it which is contingent upon their own desire to do something in the first place and having to find that. But of course, like any company, um, at least in the technology space, but elsewhere as well. It's like, how do you even help the person understand what they might be able to do? And I think a lot of people might just give up very early on and say, yeah, this is probably not worth the struggle. 
I'd rather not stick out here anyways. Uh, uh, yeah, I think this is so common. And honestly, that's the mindset that had to be reversed here because it was like a $500 opportunity on paper in CRM. This is a $500 customer. And I just, you have to take it on a certain amount of faith that if you get them there and you show them what's possible, it's this very much uh, the art of the possible. Like, not only can you build great things with this, but let me show you how easy it is. And this was a second way that I think I differentiated myself as a seller was I became very deep on the tech and I was very self-reliant when it came to like demoing and enabling. So if my customer was trying to do something, I felt like I needed to know exactly how to use the APIs that way and what parts of the documentation are going to matter and what are the best practices technically. Because, you know, as a seller, you're, you're never going to be able to compete with like the technical depth even a technical sale of your buyer. They're always going to know more than you technically. You can know more than them about your own product. And that's how I viewed like my value. I can be, I can answer your questions about everything on the business side and I can answer all your questions on the technical side. And if we go so deep that I can't, I know exactly who to bring in and I'm going to serve that up on a silver platter. So it's like really making them feel like I provided value in every single interaction. So they would want to keep talking to me and they would want me to talk to more people at the company. Yeah, of course. And I think it goes without saying that when you actually make someone look good and um, show yourself as a really, as a resource to anybody, and it's probably underrated just to even make friends in this yes. world, but, um, <laughs> but they will refer you to someone else too. And so, you know, as you kind of approach that next stage, and I'm sure you were getting a claim internally and um, within that, within their company, um, was this something, you know, where you were just deciding to go on site and visit these people all the time? How'd you think about that next stage of expanding from there? Oh, yeah, there was there was that like fuzzy middle area where it's like, OK, we've had success together. I hadn't seen them in person yet, but. I knew there was more out there. So with it, what I discovered was that this group that built this first use case, they were part of a labs team. So they weren't really the people that would necessarily have like a high dollar use case for me, but we had a great relationship and they were great advocates. So I did discovery with them. But like, how do you all do these things in your company? Like who owns notifications? Who owns the contact center? I mean, you think about technology, like who buys stuff? And they were so, we were so friendly at that point that they were super helpful. So they're like, oh, yeah, okay, contact center's here. Here's the executive it rolls up under. Here's how we think about SMS notifications for the whole business or like the whole bank, at least. So they started to give me some guideposts because they wanted to like help me because at that point we were friendly. And so they started making some introductions. They said, hey, there's some some guys in our like central team um, that manage all the IT infrastructure and shared services. And like they saw what we're doing and they're curious about it. Would you talk to them? So had a bunch of meetings with these two guys. And again, like very technical guys, not the folks who own the budget, but definitely influencers, developers. This is another place I think sales can go wrong when you're, especially in a technical sale, you think, oh, developer, great. But like, let me get to the person who owns the budget, to the executive. This is totally backwards. Like, you need that developer to love you. That person who's actually going to implement the technology has to love you and love it. So I spent a ton of time with those guys and they were pretty guarded. So they weren't really like telling me why they were talking to me or like they weren't willing to engage in a lot of discovery. And that was the point at which I thought I, these, I need to see these people in the flesh. So the first place that happened is I got them to come out to our conference. So we had this great user conference signals, like really just incredible experience, like lots of investment there. And USAA sent these two technical guys out to our conference and uh, they had an amazing experience and it was hilarious in retrospect to hear why they did this. And they said, yeah, honestly, our executive sent us out to figure out if you're a real company or not. <laughs> we needed to see firsthand, like, is this legit? Like, what is this? Like, is this a real going concern? Should we actually spend money here? And they and do text passed, messages. I, yeah. 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 We, we, we passed the vibe check on that. And they're like, OK, yes, this is legit. You're good. And that's what opened the door for me to then go on site. So that got me my first meeting USAA in person. Got it. That is really interesting. And, you know, 
There's one thing that you mentioned that you and I talked about this at a very high level in a previous conversation, but you're talking about expanding people, expanding usage throughout an organization. And you mentioned this really interesting phrase, right? You said you had to take a different approach, as you mentioned, to, to traditional enterprise sale. And the words you used were, but I also wanted to make it feel like they're getting access to something special. Now, I think those two ideas are actually almost on their face, a conflict with each other is yeah, everyone can use it. Yet it's something special. And maybe you've learned some things from the, you know, gaming rollout approach and how that works too. But how did you kind of think about that? Gosh, there, there's a lot here and it's so dependent on your business. For me, it all boils back down to like confidence and framing. I think when you're inside a business and you're an AE trying to sell something, you get very used to the things you have in your bag. You get very used to the technology. So it's like really easy to forget that it's actually special and you can give someone access to it. You know, in the case of Twilio, anybody could sign up on the website. But the thing that made it hard for enterprises was that um, you were sometimes like prohibited by policy from doing that. And you had to at least like put a credit card down, even if you weren't really going to spend money. And a lot of people would be really nervous about that. So the magic tool I had in my bag there was I could give you access to a production account without you putting a credit card on file and I could give you $20 of credit. And it's a very simple thing that I think we took for granted. But for me as a seller, I was like, this is huge. Like I can, this is a big deal for somebody who wants to start building. And I would really build that up with my prospects and say, like, I am giving you a full production account. Like you can build anything. You can try it all out. You can touch it all. Like nothing is gated. You have access to everything. And then I would focus on educating and enabling them. A lot of my deals, what would end up happening, and it happened here too, is in that kind of POC account with $20 of credit, the developer would end up building something real. And by the time I negotiated with the folks who did own budget and could green light something and we got to the contract signature, the thing was already built. <laughs> it was like happening in parallel. And I think you can do this with any kind of technology. You just have to think about what makes it special. You know, my the current business I'm in at Vanta, we offer trials and it's a it's the same kind of idea. Like, hey, we can give you the keys to the kingdom. Try it out. See how great it is. It has real value. I think salespeople can forget that that's actually special. No. And and also once it's in someone's hands, of course, it becomes a totally different, you know, you learn that from going through the mall and the kiosks and people putting something into your hand. And then basically by the time you don't want to do it anymore, you're like, you know, the kids are telling the parents, we really want this thing. It's already in our hands now. And so, yeah, to your point, there's like this inertia effect um, that maybe you have there, especially with what you did. So I am curious about kind of like what happened next, right? You became this legitimate company. How did you actually go about expanding there, especially given what you did with such a, I don't know, substrate, right? That uh, could anything could be done with it. How did you kind of think about that next day? Yeah, we had such a great base at this point. So next milestone for me was to sell literally anything to the central IT group. Like I just wanted in with them because it wasn't, a real vendor in their eyes, having sold to a labs group. Like that was great. That was cute. But we were off on the side. I hadn't gone through the like hardcore procurement process. I wasn't vetted by the central IT group. So I had to crack that. And the way I thought about that was it didn't even matter how many dollars at that point. Deal size was irrelevant. It was about getting the door open. And once the door was open, I knew I could go get more. So I ended up like investing a huge amount of time in that because I knew that was like the, the first labs deal was great, but my real land deal was this one with IT. And it took at least nine months of after that in-person conference meeting. I went out there repeatedly. It's a really unique site. It's like because it's they've got so many um, military folks and like because of the DNA of the company, it's almost like a bunker there in San Antonio. They've got this wild like you know, miles long underground tunnel system under their thing. And it's just like this incredible facility. It's really unique. And they also have like a really special culture. So the people are amazing. So I just went and spent a lot of face time with them. And, you know, get your face in the place is very real. And I think people have forgotten that post pandemic. 
just like you build familiarity by giving access to the product, like getting your face in the place really matters. And you build relationships. And I, I built relationships steadily up the chain. So I figured out who owned that IT budget. Who was that guy's boss? I made friends with that guy. He was a lovely human being. And, you know, we really hit it off. And then we figured out who owns the whole group. And then that guy, it turns out, EVP, he actually reports to the CIO. So we started working the chain. And then I started bringing executives from San Francisco to meet those folks. So we would fly folks in. In one case, we had a whole day session. We would uh, just meet everybody and anybody from the developers all the way to this EVP who was involved. And it was all to build credibility and crack that door. So in the end of that phase of the process, we ended up with a deal that was like a one-year deal that was about five times the size of the original labs deal. So now we're really getting traction. Things are feeling really good. Like we have, we're, we're a verified vendor. And now what IT was telling me was, we now own your relationship with the company and we will represent you to other groups who might want to buy your technology. So now I'm in formally. It's still the simplest possible use case, but you know, we're, we're, we're multiplying the uh, ARR pretty dramatically at this point, but we were not quite yet done. Yeah. Well, and I, I of course, I mean, uh, We've had a lot of episodes before where people have talked about this kind of stuff where it's, we talk about a, a deal win, but that doesn't necessarily mean one moment. That means meeting those people. And I'm sure you had to continue asking people, hey, can I meet this person? Right? It's not just even about impressing them, but it's, can you please introduce me and going on site and you're basically a USA employee at that point. And so you've closed this deal. I'm sure you're getting some internal recognition within the company. Uh, now, what keeps you from not resting on your laurels at that point? Like, what, what are the next uh, stages? I, I, I'm not built to rest on my laurels. That's not a thing that I, I do. Um, I don't enjoy it. For some I, I like the discomfort of, like, continuing to drive forward. And it, I think it is the gamer in me, honestly, because at each step, it was sort of like as you're in a video game and you walk further ahead and you can see beyond the fog just a little further. The relationship was a lot like that. So it was like, okay, now we've mapped out. We're a real vendor. I've got all of my, I've got an extended team at this point starting to get mapped into this organization. And I really started to discover more about the company because big companies are so complex. And in this case, they've got a banking uh, group and they've got insurance and they've got like all of these different arms of the company. So I'm starting to discover the dynamics of those and who makes decisions about how they serve customers. And I started sort of getting into all those other little pieces and starting to think about, OK, the website, who owns live chat on the website, the contact center, who owns those voice calls and like, what are they using? So it's just like this very intricate, lengthy process of d deep discovery to figure out what else is out there. And I think this is one of the biggest mistakes salespeople make. They think of discovery as a, like a one-time event or specific to their opportunity. But if you really are going to go out and do the big deals, you got to think about discovery as a never-ending, ongoing art. And you've got to talk to anyone and everyone. You've got to be willing to ask questions that are beyond your comfort level. You have to like ask for the introductions and help get people comfortable with them. So as we discovered that bigger world, I saw two things on the horizon. I saw that with the basic use case we had, that there was still more there and that there was an opportunity about six times bigger than the one I had just signed if we could just capture that basic SMS use case for like the whole company. And so I started going after that. At the same time, I saw there were these longer term opportunities. They had a contact center and, you know, Twilio does voice and chat and all these other has a contact center platform. So I started pursuing that at the same time. And at a certain point, I had all of these different plates spinning of different conversations and opportunities throughout the org. And even the fact that we were in all of those conversations, it helped me get to the point that we were able to close that six times bigger opportunity for the same use case. And at that point, they became one of Twilio's largest customers and the number two biggest Fortune 500 customer, the company. Wow. Now, 
I mean, I guess the first thing I think about is like, you know, you're talking about it in a bit of a procedural way, you know, where this is a lot of meetings. This is a lot of people. There's a lot of hijinks. There are mistakes. Uh, there are, you know, funny meetings internally and with the customer. What are some of like the major memories of how you got from here to there and some of the things that really stick with you? Oh my gosh. I laugh because there were so many and like the people involved were so kind and so lovely. And we had built a lot of trust at this point. And, like they definitely, I could tell at a certain point, they really wanted to do business with us, but there are still the laws of physics and math and you got to make it work. And and I remember we had this uh, this meeting and the, the two guys, I just adore them, Vaughn and Noam. I still consider them friends. We still have still have them on text. It was our meeting to pitch like the big proposal for the big, big deal. The last deal that I closed before I left Twilio. And we went through the slides and they were kind of like, I was pitching them on the value and they were like, okay, okay, we're already in. Like you can speed up, like get, get, get to the numbers. And so I get to the numbers and I tell them, here's what, here's what we're proposing. Uh, <laughs> pricing. And we're like down to 30 seconds left in the meeting. And they're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay. So this is about four times what we currently pay. Like, let's keep talking about it. Like, oh God, no. Like, I've just sank my own ship. Like, four times their current cost because we were trying to migrate them off a competitor. And I was like, at the end of the day, like, it was painful, but it was great because they had just given me a number. And now I knew what their budget was. So... That gave me what I needed to move forward. It was a painful thing in the moment to think I'd come in at 4x the cost. But we worked it out and, you know, we ended up getting a, a reasonable premium, but still within their budget. And at that point, like, they obviously couldn't tell me, here's what we spend. But they were like, they were helping guide me down the path to make this viable. Yeah, well, and of course, you're only going to really get that response if you actually say something, as opposed to tell me exactly what you spend and then everyone's going to lie anyways. You know, when we were talking before, you, you didn't really get into it, but you didn't mention that there was one memorable onsite that, you know, you kind of had a difference of perspective. What, what exactly happened there? Oh, there were a few here. I, my favorite one, actually, the most memorable was with my COO, George. So I am like, I'm definitely not a traditional seller. Like if you watch my technique, like I, I do my own thing a little bit. And uh, I can be a little freewheeling. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it really doesn't. And um, in this case, we had brought, I had brought George out and I had brought it like our sales engineer. I had like a team of five of us and we had gone on site. We had a whole day with them. And, you know, a lot of it was technical. Some of it was business. And I think probably in retrospect, the right thing to do would have been to just bring George to the business part. But I just was like, George, you're coming. Like you're in for the whole day. He was always game. So he was great. And George had been like the COO at Salesforce, like this kind of legendary guy. Like he's seen what great looks like. So I don't know why I opened myself up to this situation, but I did. And so we were there all day and some parts of that day that went really well. We had some other parts that definitely did not. Like I definitely got like we had this part of the product where we were we had some like a version of how you could implement the use case that was using our like well-established stuff. And then we had another way you could do it with some more beta products. And it got like in that section, it got messy. And the customer was asking, like, which one of these should we use? And, you know, my I, my technical team was kind of flailing a little bit. And so I stepped in and gave a definitive answer. I did not know if it was the correct answer, but I was trying to like get us back on the rails. And, you know, I just remember coming out of that meeting and we get in the car and like I'm driving George. It's just me and him. I now know what this question means. But at the time, I thought it was a genuine question. And he just said, how do you think that went? Like, I think, it, you know, I think it went OK. Like, I think it, I think we accomplished what we set out to do. And he was just quiet. He was like, mm -hmm, OK. <laughs> he made it very clear over the coming couple of days. He did not think that had gone very well. Um, and he had some very concrete feedback about how. And I think, you know, it was all very reasonable feedback. He was kind of like, let they get that off the rails got to be more definitive we got to be buttoned up about our products in these areas and you know, all of his feedback was super on point and uh you know i think for me i was ready to push us to the edge and like get a little more freewheeling on the edges and uh that was perhaps not within the realm of what he was hoping to see so we worked it out we're still good buds but uh that one was a little painful 
I think it is one of those things where two people coming in with different perspectives and different styles can be viewed as a clash. You might look at things in life. I'm talking outside of this kind of stuff too, where you're having two people solve problems and be on the same mission, but have very different approaches. And maybe someone with that level of polish or that approach would not have gotten to the point that you got to there. And so I'm imagining it took some degree of humility, forced humility for you to basically say, look, what got me here? Yeah, maybe that's not the right move for that. Or even having your own opinion about here's why I actually think it did go okay. Um, and, and being able to still think about that and move forward and say, maybe I should change. You know, this was one of my biggest learnings when I first moved into a sales management role. So I think when you come out of the AE role and IC role and you take your first sales management role, especially if you're really good at selling, which I think I'm pretty good at selling, you come in with this preconceived notion of what good looks like and the right way to do things. And the biggest thing I learned as a sales manager for the first time was I was completely clueless because I looked across this team of sellers and, you know, I was managing an enterprise sales team at Twilio. I, I moved up there. So I started with the frontline team. I grew up from three to 15. I then took on a second line role and I grew that org to 80. And then I took on like a fourth line role down the line and I had a team of 130 managing 400 million in business. And Honestly, the biggest eye opener in all of that is that there are so many different ways to get to a successful outcome. A lot of them don't look like how you would do it. And I had sellers do stuff where I'm like, there is no way they are going to succeed at closing that deal doing it like that. And I was just wrong. You know, people like being way more aggressive than I was comfortable with. Some people just like, Really, the way they put their thoughts together and proposals together, I'm like, there's just no way that works, but it works. It taught me that, like, you you just can't always know. And it is, like, part of what I love about sales is, like, the beauty of process and technology, but humanity. You know, like, there's creativity and humanity in this thing, and everybody's got their own unique way. And I've really come to respect that. And I think one of the best things you can do as a seller is allow your manager and your executives into your deals because they're going to be critical sometimes. And like, you got to be prepared to sort of eat it. And if you are, you will get better so much faster. It doesn't mean you're going to have to do everything like they think you should, but like that other perspective is so valuable and you just got to kind of suck up the feedback and uh, that will drive you to get genuinely better much more quickly. I like that perspective. And I, I do like the perspective of basically being able to say, you're going to eat it either privately <laughs> or publicly. You might as well do it publicly and make it at least a little bit impactful and learn something. Really? I, like I credit that as like the my secret to success at Twilio. Like I was willing to bring anybody into a deal. I would put myself in uncomfortable positions. I would bring Jeff into deals. I would bring George into deals. And I ate it more than once, like where I just like had an interaction that was not good or like not high quality or like I remember one meeting I had brought brought Jeff into and I don't know why I did this, but like something snapped in my brain and I just like did not do discovery. We knew these guys and we had done so much prep and they came in and they're like, yeah, we'd love to tell you more about our business. And I was like, no, nah, we're good. Um, why don't we tell you about ours? And as after I got done with the meeting, I was like, what did I just do? And I did that in front of George and Jeff. And it's not that I didn't know better. I was just nervous. And like, you know, everybody screws up in these meetings. It's I saw them screw up in meetings, too. So like a willingness to do that will help you move up. And like you will become more senior because like everybody's flawed. And if you can get comfortable with that, you don't try to hide actually going to present as much more senior yeah well i uh, at least maybe you can make somebody feel bad for you in those cases <laughs> but uh, well just to kind of tie up on uh, on this one uh with usaa what made it so meaningful for you personally did it open your aperture as to what you could achieve in general um and then you know are there any kinds of learnings or, or takeaways that you have either that you utilize now on a personal level or that you think others could could learn from there yeah it was super meaningful to me personally for a variety of reasons. Like it was, it was part of what established me as a really successful enterprise seller at Twilio, but that in and of itself was really meaningful for me. I had in the startup I had been at before Twilio, 
Um, I was the first pre-revenue hire. I owned everything customer facing. And, you know, we were trying to break into the enterprise. And I had had, let's just say it was not a very supportive environment. It was a challenging culture. I had had a couple of interactions there where my CEO and some potential investors had basically indicated to me or made it clear to me that they did not think I could succeed at selling in the enterprise, that it was like beyond my grasp. And, you know, it brought in like a consultant who they thought could do it better. And they hadn't yet, they hadn't like pushed me out, but they just made it clear they didn't believe in me. Even saw that in writing in an email that was forwarded to me that should not have been basically saying that, yeah, I'm not the, the person to lead enterprise sales. And so I came into Twilio with this chip on my shoulder of like, okay, like, let's go. Because I was angry. I was like, I wanted to prove them wrong. I'm super competitive. And it's part of why I took the enterprise AE role. One of the advisors to that startup company, same thing. He got set up as kind of like a mentor to me. And I met with this guy and had this conversation that ended with him kind of telling me about, he runs a company too. He had a VP of sales and he's like, you know, my VP sales, he's got five kids, but he's on the road every day, never sees his kids. And he loves it. It's great. He said, you know, it just takes a certain kind of person. And he made it so clear in this conversation that I was not that kind of person. So here I am coming out of this startup where they're like, you're not the kind of person to be a VP sales. You're not going to succeed at enterprise sales. I'm like, well, I am going to prove you extremely wrong. So that chip on my shoulder made this entire thing mean so much more to me to prove that I could win in a way that people had doubted me. And that sticks with me. I love to win and I love, honestly, to be the underdog. I like to win in circumstances where I am not expected to win. And this one was at the heart of that. And it was so human. I really take with me the relationships from this deal and from working with this company, the relationships within Twilio, with the customer. It's a human endeavor, man. These are like people and they have to want to work with you and you have to make it feel viable for them. And you got to think about their motivations and what matters to them and what, why do they get up in the morning? And like that human element of the sale is what I will always take with me. And it, it felt so palpable here in this specific deal. That's, that is interesting. And what sticks out to me is I totally understand why a lot of people out there might not be super passionate about what they do or about the product they sell. And there's a lot of very boring things to sell. I don't know, you sell chemicals, you sell, mm -hmm. right? And, and just, you know, by an objective observer. But the reality is it's what you've got. And so at mm -hmm. some point you got to realize that how can I actually go help the people who need this thing on some level and make that human? And maybe that makes you a little more passionate about your job of saying, yeah, I'm not necessarily obsessed with this. I wouldn't do this on my free time if I wasn't paid for it, but I would love to make some relationships out of this. Um, and I, and I am curious. Oh, go ahead. Well, there's something in there, too. I think that there are traditional salespeople who are built like that, like they can sell anything, right? Like I had a, a sales manager at Visa who told me once, great salespeople, they could sell Q-tips. Like they don't care. They just sell that. And that is not me. And I thought at the time, like, maybe I'm not cut out for this. Like, that's not me. I have to be passionate. I have to care. And that might like I sell security and compliance now. And I'm really passionate about it. And it's something that, you know, had you asked me 10 years ago, is that something I could be passionate about? I would have like not known enough to even say. And I think it just comes down to like, do you really care? Like how invested are you in what you do? Because if you're selling something you believe in and you're a part of a company that you believe in, the passion comes. And uh Without that, like, honestly, I don't want to do it. Like, for me, it's only fun with the passion. And, you know, when you can find that, that's what makes it great. Oh, I, I do think it relates to what you said before about bringing people in when you're uncomfortable is you might as well fall extremely flat on your face as opposed to just half-assing it. Where it's like you might as well go out in a burst of flames and saying, I think this is the best thing ever and reject me all you want. And saying, yeah, you know what? Actually, maybe it's not. So I'll see you later anyways. I would um, always rather fail that way, honestly. And it's like much more uncomfortable. But it goes back to how I got into sales and how I got into gaming. It's like I used to think this, like, if, if you have to cringe when you hit the send button because you know you're like pushing the edge, 
or if you know that you're leaning into an opportunity that just makes you like deeply physically uncomfortable, you're probably in the right place. And, you know, it, it is going to lead to some spectacular failure. And then it's just about, you know, picking yourself up and knowing we're all human and, and you just go on to the next one. And now you're going to be better because you learned that lesson. Yeah, and it will be OK. Uh, now, the one thing I, I was thinking about as you were talking is you, you briefly mentioned it having a very notorious win in the game quake with one of the game designers um you know how does that compare to this kind of achievement and closing this deal today do, do you analogize those at all which was more satisfying and you know i'm sure you're more passionate about one of them i but but they are all equally rewarding if i'm being completely honest like it it, it what i see is the commonality of that win against that designer. So he, I was playing him in person. This is like late nineties. And I went down to their office in Dallas and we were playing a best of three. So we played a, a death match to 25 frags, 25 points. And it was best of three games with 25 points each. And I, I won the first death match and then he won the second one. And in the third one, I was down badly. So I was down like 16 to three and it was looking like I was going to lose. And he had made some like he had we had a crowd there. And he had made some kind of sexist comment and something like snapped in my brain. <laughs> like, I'm not gonna, I can't lose this. Like, I'm not going to lose this. I can't let this happen. And I just went on a rampage and I came back and ended up winning like 25 to 19. And so I won the best of three. and. Like that come from behind. I I love to win when it looks like I'm not going to win. And so it feels like that to me in business as well. I love to fight. I love to be with the underdog. And I love to overcome challenges. So I don't want it to be easy in, in a certain way. And, you know, if I'm in a situation that feels too easy, I look for the things that are harder to go solve. Like I love to solve those hard problems and really face those challenges head on. Well, it does lead to an interesting question where clearly you've had this rich career, rich life. You've had a lot of wins. Um, you know, you're clearly passionate about your kid. Um, you know, one quote that stuck with me that I read from the Vanity Fair article was about how it's never going to be as hard again, right? You basically have achieved the success already. As you think about that act you're in now, you just mentioned, you know, I want to be with the underdog. You kind of can't completely manufacture that anymore. You have to like fake it a little bit. Um, what does motivate you at this point to keep striving? Is that motivation changing over time? Is there a specific mark that you want to look back um, on that you've left as you look at things today? I think the thing for me is that there's never a destination. There's never that like end goal that I'm trying to hit. To me, it is that continuous game. So I find like the joy and the challenge in every day of that interaction. And so for me right now, you know, I'm at Vanta, I'm 18 months in for this like series B growth stage company. And for me, the game now is like build a generational company, like build greatness and do it in a way that is unmatched. And the beauty of that game and doing it from the CRO role there is there's no a playbook for this. You know, we're selling this great security compliance solution, SaaS solution in, at a time when the, the market is weird. And, you know, we had 40 plus copycat competitors enter the market and try to take it from us. And we've had all of this, you know, just change. And it's hard under any circumstances to build a company at this scale. So to me now, it's in that fight. Like, okay, we've got an incredible company that's growing in ways that are unmatched. Like, how do we do even better? How do we seed expectations on every axis? So it never feels manufactured to me. Like that day-to-day -day feels hard and challenging and so rewarding because there's no end point. I'm not trying to like hit some goal and then say, yep, I did it. It's done. I'll ne it'll never be done for me. So you don't have to invent a new boss so much as just find what that next one might be. There is um, never a final boss. There is always a bigger boss. To come. You just got to go find them. Well, that's what makes people so unhappy half the time. But 
Um, I love it. I'm thrilled. Sure. Well, um, just to finish off here, we always end by asking our guests about, you know, one to three of the top mentors that really made an impact on their career. And, you know, if there are any stories that really represented that impact that those folks had on them. I know you already mentioned George is one, but um, are there any other folks that you would kind of bring up and mention? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I got to double down on George. He was a mentor, is a mentor and a friend. I would not be a CRO without George. You know, he embraced my unconventional approach and think that like I thrived in a, in a he's, he's known for being super harsh, like He's so smart and asks really hard questions. And I really thrived under that scrutiny because I loved it. Like, I love to spar with him and bring opinions and debate. You know, he did that for me and he also supported me. He's really sponsored me uh, in a lot of ways. So I'm super grateful to call him a friend and mentor. Another is Matt Golden, who is the guy who gave me my very first job in sales. Matt is now a venture capitalist. He was running sales at this Canadian startup at the time called Tira Wireless out of Toronto. And he just, he's a genuinely lovely person. He also, I mean, it's like, he was so harsh with me in a lot of ways. You know, he took me on the road in these sales meetings. And after every meeting with a customer, I was so clueless and I was so shy. And after every meeting, he would just like totally rip me apart. And just like, that was terrible. You said nothing of value. Here's what you should have done. Like, it was so painful, but I don't think I've ever accelerated my development so fast in my life. And it all came from a good place. I know he wasn't trying to be mean. He was just trying to make me better. And, uh, and he really did. Like, without him, I would not have this career. So those two guys, there are so many others. Nanea Reeves, who's somebody in gaming. Uh, a woman who I really look up to, who was an early, early mentor and an actual other woman in gaming, like <laughs> blew me away that she was in a leadership role and she has always supported me as well. So, so many incredible folks along the way. Allison Welch at Twilio, who was my direct manager for a lot of my time there. She really helped pull me up. She gave me my opportunity as a frontline leader and a second line leader at Twilio. And she just uh, supported me every step of the way. So friends and mentors across the board, I'm so grateful. I've had a lot of great ones. Oh, and it's always inspiring to hear about those. And it is the hidden key to success behind so many great leaders. Obviously, they were once those people getting berated, as you just mentioned. <laughs> and so if they could just take that on, they'll do that. But um, but no, it's fantastic to hear about that for you and especially throughout your many careers at this point. But uh, <laughs> we really appreciate hearing it. And thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This has been great. Thanks, as always, for joining us on another episode of The Windwire. We'd appreciate it if you could share it on LinkedIn, Twitter, and rate us or leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Helps others discover the show and join our growing community. Our contact info is in the show notes, including our show email. You can see all episodes at thewindwire.com and then your favorite podcast player. And don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode.